Hello and uh, greetings. <clears throat> Welcome uh, everybody to another edition of Beyond the Headlines. Uh, this one is for Newspaper Week. As you see, I have my garishly red Post and Courier shirt on. Celebration of this week recognizes the service of newspapers and their employees across North America. Uh, we have with us for this special edition, uh, Tony Bartlemy from our staff and Matthew Hensley, the managing editor of the Index Journal in Greenwood. And anytime now we should have uh, Travis Jenkins as well. He's the editor of the Chester News and Reporter. He's having a little bit of technical difficulties joining us. Uh, all, all these folks have been working uh, on our Uncovered project. I uh, hope you all have been following that. It's basically a look at questionable government actions throughout South Carolina. Uh, it's a pretty ambitious project. We've partnered with 17 uh, community newspapers around the state, and uh, we're really just kind of rooting around on tips and, and looking into uh, questionable actions and misconduct and things of that nature, uh, which we've seen quite a bit of around the state. And uh, both Matthew and uh, Travis have, have played uh, pretty vital roles in this effort. Um, I'm gonna remind everybody that the event is being recorded and that a link will be sent after the event in case anyone has any more questions or wants to watch this again. I uh, also encourage anyone to submit questions through the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can. Uh, I'm going to start off with Tony. Tony, I can think of no better way to mark Newspaper Week than to celebrate what we have accomplished this year through Uncovered. Can you tell us a little bit, a bit about this project and how it came about? and the work we have been doing this year with it. Absolutely, yeah, thanks Glenn and hi everybody. You know, I'm always excited to talk about Uncovered. It's, it's really, I think one of the most exciting projects we've done here uh, in, in South Carolina, I, I think. Um, so let, let me give you a little background, the origin story. I like to think of it as, as uh, three links in a chain with uh, the first link going back a few years ago when we got a pile of spending documents um, from a solicitor, a prosecutor in Richland and Kershaw counties, a guy named Dan Johnson. And we were looking through these documents and we kept on seeing these really weird expenses like, you know, why, you know, why was Dan Johnson flying off to the Galapagos Islands, you know, with his girlfriend, you know, and on the ratepayers tab and or on the taxpayers tab. And, you know, you know, why is he, uh, you know, why is he taking this $179 Uber trip in Minneapolis? And I remember I'm from Minneapolis originally, so I know that Prince is a big deal in Minneapolis. And so I traced his, his route on the Uber receipt, and lo and behold, he spent $179 to go look at Prince's house on the uh, taxpayer's tab. So long story short, we exposed Dan Johnson's corrupt spending pra uh, practices, uh, and he went to federal prison. Um, the second link um, really stems from that first one. We we realized that Dan Johnson had gotten his start with uh, in, in the sheriff's office. And so we thought, you know, we've had a lot of problems with sheriffs. So let's go look at at, uh, at sheriffs across South Carolina. And we, we blanketed the state with FOIA requests. And then pretty soon we, we started seeing a similar pattern in Chester County, you know, um, where uh, a sheriff by the name of then, then a sheriff by the name of Alex Underwood was flying off first class to all these conferences and getting these big room upgrades, sort of same story. And we, uh, we worked with that and that, that's where I got to know Travis Jenkins. I don't know if he's on yet, but he, he works for the, the, the Chester paper. And um, we, again, we exposed Alex Underwood's uh, uh, corrupt practices and he was convicted by a federal jury. And so we started thinking you know, a little deeper, you know, why is this happening? And we also learned about some other spending practices up in the Chester area. And pretty soon we had, you know, this, this idea of, of teaming up with local papers, collaborating with them instead of competing with them and e exposing uh, corruption and other misconduct throughout the state in a real meaningful way. So that's really how it all began. And, and um, from there, we've, we've done a laundry list of uh, investigations. I've really enjoyed working on this with, especially with these local, uh, local papers around South Carolina. Matthew, um, you, you, your paper has been a big part of this. Let me say, the Index Journal has really made a name for itself around South Carolina as a staunch advocate for the Freedom of Information Act and shining a light on the actions of public officials. 
Why is it so important for your paper to do that? And how have those efforts been received locally? Also, why did you want to join and become part of Uncovered? It's looking like Matt's trying to rejoin us. Um, so I'll just I'll just say that you know as as Matt tries to rejoin us, we started working with with uh, the Index Journal on a project um, about uh, the Governor's School in in uh, McCormick County. And the, you know, this is where I got my introduction to the Index Journal. I knew they'd done a lot of good work over the years, but um, you know, it, it, I, I really got an inside look at how great a, a paper that is. Um, as we investigated this this you know school kind of in the middle of nowhere that had done you know had some questionable um, um, bidding practices, really. So uh, I, I don't know if he's still on, but. Uh, Man, it's one of the best uh, collaborations we've had so far. Looks like he's still trying to join us. So we're, we do have Travis, though. Travis, if you're there, if you, there, that's awesome. If you want to unmute yourself as well, perfect. Um, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, you work in a two-person shop in Chester County, which has experienced a, a real run of corruption prosecutions in recent years, including charges against your former sheriff and the county administrator. Tell us a little bit about just like how, how many things you juggle in the course of doing your job and at that weekly newspaper and how you carve out time to handle the investigations you work on to hold officials accountable, because you really do. You really have pushed a whole number of really great things into the light with everything else you have going on. Why is it so important for you to pursue this work? Well, uh, as you said, we we have a new staff of two people, myself and reporter Brian Garner. We have five municipalities, a county, uh, school district, uh, courts, crime, sports, and all that stuff to divvy up between the two of us. So um, it is difficult to do. It's one of the reasons that the partnering with you guys was, was so appealing to us. But the, the reason that you have to do it is at this point, most county meetings and, and a lot of, uh, of municipality meetings are broadcast live online. And people who are community minded and care about what's happening a lot of times they're watching those meetings so to just write what happened to to those folks who are probably also readers if they're if they care about what happens in the community isn't really enough anymore uh, as far as we're concerned so you you don't you don't necessarily need to tell them what happened in a meeting you you have to go deeper than that because you know they, they can they can just watch a meeting now and they and they know what happened so it's important to dig deeper and Chester has had, as you said, an awful lot of um, interesting things happen. <laughs> I think it's probably a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, I told somebody, uh, 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 because it's funny, people who aren't familiar with Chester will say, gosh, how do, you, how do you fill up a paper with stuff that happens in a little county like Chester? And you're like, man, you have no idea <laughs> what it's like. <laughs> I, I told somebody at one point last year when you know, we had, uh, as you alluded to, we had charges against um, – or an indictment of a sheriff and two former deputies, county supervisor, had a, a city councilman removed from office by a judge. I said, this is like a more humid version of Twin Peaks or something. Yeah, Just right. the degree of, 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 uh, of things that happen that, that you just got, you, you think, God, that stuff doesn't happen anywhere, but it does. Um, and you have to think Chester's not unique. I mean, in, in that respect, I mean, those things happen everywhere, which is another thing that this series has kind of helped unearth, maybe in some places, there aren't active newspapers. There aren't, um, uh, you know, people who 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 are there to to do the digging necessarily. But, and 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 a lot of times it's not that they don't want to. It, it's a, just a matter of you know if you're if you're like a, you know, there are some some newspapers that don't have two people that we do. It, in a lot of cases, it's one person that's literally doing everything, including answering the phone and helping customers that walk in the front door and covering every meeting and doing their own photography and layout and design and everything. It's, it's a lot to juggle. I mean, how, how is, um, I remember you telling me earlier this year about how, you know, you, you might be covering the, the local basketball game and then rushing over to cover a meeting. And then, then you've got to meet somebody and may, maybe somebody's caught a big fish in, in the lake or down by the falls or something, yeah. all, all the stuff that people want to see. And then you're still carving out time to read through like five to 8,000 emails from, uh, the local school board to, to get some, bring something into the light. How was your work received there? And I mean, who, who would be doing this stuff if you weren't? 
if, 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 if Brian and I weren't doing it, I don't guess anybody would, uh, because we're, we're the only, there are some other, it, Chester has had enough large scale stories that, you know, there are, there is some media that will come and cover some things that happen here, but doing the day-to-day stuff, it's just, it's just Brian and I. Um, and it is hard to juggle because we, we, I, I, I was covering a court case, I think in, uh, it was it actually it was moved to Fairfield County, but it was something that was uh, that happened in Chester. So, you know, I'm I'm at, at a courthouse in Winsboro, and as I'm driving over there, Brian calls me and says, "Hey, we have like a, a major industrial fire." <laughs> so, it, it, you know, and the, and a lot of these things happen. The the, uh, the 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 universe doesn't care that there's only two of us. So a lot of times things like that will start dropping all at once, and you just have to do your do, do the best you can to cover all of it. And, yeah, and, make time, and make time for, for, for other things that people expect from a community newspaper, like if somebody shows up with a catfish big enough, you know, that they could stick their head in the thing's mouth, sitting on the back of their truck, and they're like, hey, man, can we put this in, in the paper? You, you still want to do things like that. While, while I mean, we're a community newspaper, so things that happen in the schools and things that happen with community groups, those, those are important. Um, if, 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 you know, a, a certain number of people want to, want to see it if it's important to them it should be important to us is the way i look at it but then we also have to pivot and do the bigger things you know covering court cases and uh pouring through FOIA documents which you alluded to the school district when we we got it's been several years ago we had a lawsuit uh where i if i remember correctly the uh superintendent was suing the district and a couple of school board members and we thought well maybe there's something in their emails that would show us what the friction and the conflict involves so we filed a FOIA for like a year's worth of emails and it ended up being like 5,500 pages of emails and that's days of work to just to, to sit to sit and read 5,000 pages of anything um, it is interesting to know that they get the same you know weird scuzzy spam things for pills <laughs> that we <laughs> that everybody gets and they're you're like okay well i can just skip through these but you you have to sit there and and read you know 5500 pages i mean that 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 takes one, one and when it's one person doing it especially or even if it's two i mean that's days and days and days of work you just have you just have to make yourself do it while also doing the the normal day-to-day things of covering five municipalities and crime and schools and sports and everything else yeah, it's, it's amazing. We're always amazed at, at, at what you, you what you get in the paper there every week. It's really great work. Um, is Matthew joined us yet, or he's still uh, still not with us? I guess. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Tony, what do you see as some of the biggest benefits of uncovered so far working with folks like Travis? Travis and, and Matthew. And uh, what do you think we're going to see in the next, uh, you know, without giving away too much, I guess, what's going to come up in the next uh, month or two as we round out the year? Yeah. So the, some of the biggest, you know, biggest benefits are, you know, so investigative reporting takes uh, a lot of time to do. And, and, and fortunately, the post career has uh, a built enough of a kind of a project culture to, to give reporters that kind of time to dig, dig deep. Um, what we don't always have is this on the ground, intense, um, you know, uh, knowledge of a, of a community, especially one that's not exact, you know, precisely in our circulation area. So, so when we are able to, to work with people like Travis and Matthew, um, you know, instantly we we're a much stronger team because we've got that benefit of that, that, that institutional knowledge. So, you know, we saw that we've seen that over and over in, you know, in Chester, when we were working on the, on, on stories that expose some of the natural gas authority spending um, and the, the sheriff and, and, and actually so many stories out of Chester. Um, and then also in, in, uh, in the Greenwood area with, with uh, the John De La Howe Agricultural uh, School. Um, that, that kind of collaboration actually, I think, you know, it energized me, uh, hopefully it energized um, uh, our partners as well. Um, and as far as what's coming up, you know, we, we've got it. Uh, you know, I'm excited a, a lot about a story that we're uh, another um, uh, member of our, our project team is doing, Jennifer Hawes. She's working on a, a, a really interesting story about local newspapers and why they're just so important and really gets to the heart of really why we're doing this whole project to begin with. Yeah, one of the things from, from that story uh, that's a great takeaway is uh, she went to a community or 
Stephen Hobbs went to that community, actually, as part of that a community that lost its newspaper within the last year or so. And all the people there uh, discovering things that they'd missed because they didn't have the newspaper every week, whether it was the photo of the senior class or an obituary, somebody died, they didn't even know it till after the funeral. Uh, it really struck the community once it was gone, how much how much that newspaper provided, that wealth of information, and how it really bind, it can bind a community together. It's that glue, as, as Jennifer said. That's coming, uh, it's coming in about a week, and it, I would highly encourage anyone to read it. Um, I wanted to ask Travis, you had one of our more successful ones this year, too, where you partnered with Avery Wilkes, and looking at a councilman you had in Chester, who was a convicted felon and shouldn't have been elected in the first place, and then continued to go traveling on the public's dime, even while under suspension. Um, how did you come across that story? And what was it like working with, with uh, Avery uh, to try to bring that one home? Uh, Avery was terrific to work with, uh, because first of all, Avery has roots in Chester. I mean, he, he's from here. We're both Chester High graduates, Chester High School, cradle of journalism, I guess, in the state of South Carolina. Um, since both of us went there, but no, he, he has, he has terrific knowledge of the area. He knows a lot of the people too. Uh, it was, it, he was, he was fantastic to work with. And it's not a minor point that as part of that story, we, we had covered a lot of aspects of it about, you know, the, the, when his criminal background became that councilman's, uh, criminal background became known, um, you know, we, we were able to FOIA some documents that demonstrated that he continued to be paid while he was suspended, even though I, I think the attorney general has previously said that that is not a thing that should happen. But it's not a minor point at all that the Post and Courier through the Uncovered Project and partnering with us wrote the check to pay for some additional uh, FOIA expenses to flush out the spending from uh, a trip to, I think, San Antonio or Houston for a National League of Cities thing, uh, convention that, that he attended and uh, things like trying to pay for mouthwash and uh, <laughs> however many meals at Whataburger and things like that. But th that, that really helped craft the story. Cause that, I mean, we, we had the background on the fact that, you know, it turned out he was uh, a felon. He shouldn't have, should never been allowed to run for office in the first place. That he continued to be paid. We had lots of um, things that had happened, you know, that we had covered during his tenure that were somewhat controversial. But it was it was the Post and Courier's willingness to write the check for those deeper digs, which are which sometimes are not inexpensive and are sometimes out of the reach of some small newspapers uh, that that really made that story. And what it did was it went beyond being a story about the councilman in particular, and it really kind of showed you. It painted a picture and not an especially flattering one of of how the city was run in general. Yeah, and, and as you point out, those, those FOIA costs, um, not insignificant uh, for anybody, really, under that law now, how they can charge basically anything they want for redacting and retrieving documents. I mean, we've gotten bills for up to a quarter million dollars. That's that's daunting for, for any size newspaper. We, we got one for 28,000 once upon a time. Yeah, so. it's crazy. Matthew, you're, you're back. Thank you for joining us again. Um, well, we're talking about FOIA. The, the Index Journal has earned a really great reputation for being a staunch advocate of the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, you, you guys really always push to hold officials accountable and drag stuff into the light. Why is that such an important part of your mission there? Well, uh, th that's such an important thing for us to do because those aren't the government's records. Those don't belong to them. They belong to us. They belong to the people. And it, it's very important for us to know what's happening with our money in our name from these government entities. Um, it, and. I think we're also concerned if we ever let up on some of this stuff, if we ever, well, I guess we don't need it that much. Let's let's not go back and ask them to go back and find this, that it, they will think that the next person comes and asks for that kind of document, for that kind of information, um, that they can exclude that for them as well. Um, so, so we try to take that very seriously. Well, good, good. It shows, definitely. And so you, you've you really dug in, too, and been working closely with, with Tony on the John DeWa Howe story. Uh, 
after that initial story, really impressive how you picked up the baton and, and ran with that and found all sorts of different angles. Uh, what, what's that experience been like working on that story and working with us? And also, uh, what are some of the stuff that, that you had covered afterwards that you've well, been pursuing? Yeah. For me, it was very interesting kind of go through and look at this. And, and what, what caught my eye is going through the, the initial batch of procurement documents is that they had all of these transactions that were less than $10,000. And it, it kind of reminded me about how there's the, the federal banking law where any transaction that's $10,000 or more, your bank has to report the federal government. And if you skirt that, it, it starts to become illegal because you're trying to hide something from the federal government. Obviously, keeping all these under 10,000 isn't necessarily a criminal matter in this case, but that's what kind of got me looking more at, well, what does the law say about this? What, what more is there that we should know about it, about how uh, this money's being spent? Um, and, and I found pretty quickly that um, you're not allowed to divide up purchases in that way, where you're, you're making it where you can make these transactions happen without going through a bigger process. Um, Okay, what's, what's the impact of that work been so far? Well, for one, there was the, uh, the procurement audit that happened that really, um, that really showed that there were some concerns with how uh, they were using money, how they were splitting up uh, contracts to be able to award the same, or to the same company without having to go through a bidding process. Um, but other local governments also have taken notice of this. Um, we actually had a school board that talked about it at one of their meetings of, well, hold up, how does our process work for procuring stuff? Um, do, do we do everything by the book? Do we have to have anything to worry about if, if say, the, the index journal or someone else starts looking at what we've been doing? Um, so it, I think it's really helped the community kind of see what responsible government's supposed to do and made our local governments kind of take another look at how they're doing business. Um, okay. Uh, all right, we're gonna to get to some questions now from, from some readers and viewers. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll throw this one at Travis. Um, how do we maintain and promote unbiased journalism with all the inflammatory political pressures so prevalent in our society? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. You have to have people doing this who are doing it for the right reasons. And that's not being to uh, promote a particular point of view. Um, it's people who understand that it's it's a lot of work and it's not always a lot of remuneration um, necessarily, but that, that this is what we that what we do on, on, on any level. And this is from taking the picture of the catfish all the way up to you know covering federal corruption issues is it's it's important. There's a reason that it's that 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 that, that, that our profession is specifically numerated in the constitution. It's, it's that important, but you have to have people who understand that. And I, I wanna I uh, just bounce off one thing uh, Matthew said there a second ago. It's, it's very important to, to stress to citizens that the Freedom of Information Act is there for everybody. It's not just for us. Mm -hmm. um, we would certainly use it more in our line of work than, than other people would, but I, we've had people come to us before and say, hey, can you, can you file a Freedom of Information request for me. And, I, and we always say, well, yeah, we can, but you know, you could do it yourself. You can do it. It's not, some people have the idea that it's the exclusive province of, of journalists and it's, it's there for anybody to use it. We try to stress that uh, editorially as often as we can. Okay. Good point. Very good point. All right, Tony, this one's for you. Uh, does the makeup and history of South Carolina institutions and a lack of close oversight of its elected and appointed officers make them more prone to bad behavior than elsewhere? Any thoughts on that? Oh, man. Man, that's a deep question, right? So, so <laughs> yeah. basically asking whether or not our, our history has helped promote corruption. I love that question. And, and I love that because it's probably, you could probably make a good argument that, you know, with with the, the powers of these rural sheriffs and then just the rural nature of, of the state um, and the lack of oversight that you start to create the conditions where you know, people in power um, divert funds to help their buddies. You know, you know, there's a reason why we say good old boy uh, system, you know, and so, and you know what, you know, the, 
the kind of the plantation paradigm, you know, where, you know, that, that probably plays into that, uh, the whole corruption aspect too. But so is corruption also, is corruption worse in South Carolina? You know, hard to say. I, I would say you could take a look at Illinois and you could take a look at in New Jersey and, and find a fair amount of corruption there too. But I will say in South Carolina that our, our, our ethics laws and our, our checks and balances um, are really, really weak and, and don't provide the kind of deterrent that, that we probably need. Okay. Um, Matthew, here's one for you uh, from a journalism teacher. Uh, I teach journalism at Charles of Charleston every semester. I have one or two students who may be considering journalism as a career, but few are thinking daily newspaper. What would be your sales pitch to students right now and why they should get into print journalism and what information about internships could you provide? I think at the end of the day, newspapers are where so much journalism starts. Um, even a lot of good stuff that you end up seeing on TV at the end of the day is stuff that starts uh, in local newsrooms, sometimes very small newsrooms from, from small town reporters who are finding these sometimes as a feature, sometimes it's digging into corruption, all sorts of different stories that then kind of trickle up. Um, and I think there's a similar to, to going to a newspaper too, uh, because you are in a community, you're reporting on the community, you're part of a community, a, a, a lot more so than if you're, say, at a um, larger institution. Um, and, and so I think that has, that, that could have some real appeal. Um, as far as internships are concerned, um, I know the Press Association has some that, that they do every year. But just talking to a local newspaper, you'll often find that there are things out there that aren't being listed uh, that, that you can sign up for or that they might be willing to create an internship for you. I know if anyone has approaches us about it, we will talk to them, kind of figure out if they'd be a good fit for us and, and how we could structure something to get some good reporting out there for our readers, but to also get some, some good experience for the uh, person wanting an internship. That's a, that's a good recommendation. I, I would say too, that, I mean, what, what other job are you gonna get paid to go to work and learn stuff every day, to get access to things that other people don't, to just see cool things up, up front, to talk to really smart, intelligent, and, and some sketchy people along the way, and really get to ferret, ferret things out and help produce the first draft of history. I know that that's sort of a trite thing, but but it's not. I mean, it's, it's really producing the first draft of history and chronicling the important events and having an opportunity to make a real difference in people's lives. I mean, impactful stuff. The stuff we're writing about here, we're putting bad characters on notice. Uh, some of them are under investigation now. Uh, laws are getting changed as a result. So, I mean, it's it's like important stuff. I mean, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Why, why they no, think it's a good idea? Yeah, there's no monotony in this job. No, no two days are the same. That, that That's another thing that, that, that I, I find appealing about it, that you know, literally one day you're covering a football game and then the next day there's a major industrial fire and then, oh, look, we've had a public official that's been indicted or uh, it, it, you, it, it, there's no sameness, there's no routine and you literally have no idea what's going to happen. There, there are things that, that we, we've ended up having to cover for the last year or two that you, you almost think to yourself, well, this, this, is, this, is, this is like fiction. This, this kind of stuff doesn't happen, but it does. And you never know when it's going to happen either. So you might think, well, all right, well, today I'm going to I'm going to this meeting and then I'm going to, you know, write a couple of stories out of it. But then something huge breaks and that that suddenly you have to divert. And that I mean, I, I find that appealing is that there are no two days are ever the same. Very true. Very true. Um, OK. Hey, Tony, a uh, reader had a question, too. Uh, who, who makes decisions on FOIA costs? I, I know the, the law sets the rate that they can charge, sort of. Um, I, I'm not sure if the, they're asking if, uh, you know, who, who determines how much things are going to cost or whether we'll pay. Yeah, that, that's a good question, because it is it's vague, right? So um, our, our law has some vague guidelines about how much you can charge. Usually it has you know, an agency can charge you know, I forget the exact language, but it's, you know, the kind of the going hourly rate for the, one of their employees. Um, but, you know, we've gotten, you know, 
FOIA, you know, we've made FOIA requests that uh, reasonable FOIA requests and gotten bills uh, for thousands of dollars. And we've had to go back and negotiate and try to figure out a way um, to kind of bring the agencies back to reality in that regard. So I don't know, that's, it's, it's a problem that, that our state lawmakers probably need to address the cost. Okay. So this is open. To, okay. Uh, this is open to anyone. Um, have we ever used social media to identify improper behavior and ex activities? If so, can we share some examples? You know, we could we could point out Dan Johnson. You know, his social media pages were were full of pictures of him in the Galapagos Islands, and um, you know, with his girlfriend and posing next to a turtle. You know, things like that. So, social media pages are, are a rich um, source. In fact, you know, uh, Travis, you know, as well knows, the 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 Underwood, the Alex Underwood sheriff case, really began when uh, a essentially a young man in in Chester was videoing. Uh, a live streaming uh, a, a traffic wreck outside his house or a traffic um, disturbance outside his house. And then Alex Underwood approaches him on this live video. And, and there's a little bit of an exchange and essentially that leads to a, in what was an illegal arrest and an abuse of power. So, and, you know, we based our story, our, our very, very first story on that. Yeah. You mentioned Dan Johnson as well. The, uh, I remember there were some questionable expenditures in there about uh, Christmas parties and people said he'd had some elaborate parties and we looked back and found out that not only was he renting out a ritzy club in the Columbia area for the party, but he had hired his brother as a DJ, flown him in from, I believe it was Arizona or New Mexico to attend the thing at, at a considerable cost and then posted photos of all that on social media confirming all those suspicions. So uh, yeah, it can be, it can be uh, a useful tool to uh, pin things down for sure. Yeah, we, we, we found some connections in, in the, with the John De La House school, you know, with where, you know, a bunch of the, the people who were working for the school were also business partners with each other. And we have pictures of what they were doing. Okay. Um, another one open to anybody here too. Uh, some people had some questions about the future in newspapers and what you foresee as new ways of generating uh, revenue or, um, you know, just how can, what can people do to support local newspapers uh, in addition to subscribing, I guess? Who wants to take that? <laughs> Travis? I mean, I think... Um... Or Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, I think we are seeing a lot more kind of a nonprofit approach of, hey, let's have these funds to uh, support local journalism. I, I think y'all are, are raising some money, for example, to support Uncovered. And then there's also all sorts of grants out there too. Now that's that only helps so much. Um, some of it's gonna be about figuring out other ways to build alternative subscription models where you're paying for, okay, this, maybe you're interested in food journalism or music journalism uh, within this particular market, maybe you can sell that to someone and, and being a member of this group that gets this information, goes to these events. It's, we're having to figure out how to innovate on the fly on this, but. Yeah, good, good point. I know it, it, the papers you mentioned, we, we set up an investigative fund and, and people have donated uh, very generously to that. And all that money is, plowed straight back into these projects like Uncovered. Um, some of the money recently helped send uh, Tony to Greenland to examine uh, the effects of, of climate change and how that impacts Charleston. But um, a lot of it's been used to really just foot the bill for FOIA costs um, because they're so expensive to get a hold of those records and, and you really need the records to document stuff. And um, that, that, that's been great to be able to share that and to help some other papers get over that hurdle because I know in the past we've struggled a bit to afford, to afford some of these open records things and it's it can be substantial cost there was um one of our partners uh up in, in uh, Fairfield County um the school board there had or the superintendent there had uh basically shut her down because she didn't have the three hundred dollars to pay for the FOIA bill so it, it's it can get get in the way of uh, accountability for sure Okay, any, anyone have any uh, final thoughts before I wrap things up? 
I'll just say that that I, I've just enjoyed working with with all of our partners, and 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 I really think our our state, as as some of uh, you all mentioned, it has benefited just by the just the sheer um, yeah the collaboration. Um, other people are behaving better because of it. Travis. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, the, the the approach of the uh, uncovered project of the Post and Courier, which which obviously has you know more uh, people and resources at its disposable at its disposal than most you know smaller community papers do, putting aside the idea that that, that that's always there. I mean, we this we're we're journalists, but the, I mean, this is also a business, and and in some cases there there would be. Uh, uh, sort of a competition between papers or I'm not going to share this information with them that that everybody's been willing to kind of put that aside for the greater good I think has been terrific because the the, the work that's come out of this I, I think has been very important and very impactful yeah I, I, I agree I, it's been fun to share stuff with with everybody and to collaborate on things and uh, um, it, it, it's been just neat seeing these stories come to light uh, final thoughts Matthew I'm going to kind of uh, mirror those comments. Uncovered has been really nice for us in getting our readers more involved and kind of seeing what's happening on the state. But, but for us, it's also kind of invigorated us some because we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day business of running a newspaper and getting uh, stories out that sometimes we, we can't take a step back and look at the big picture. So like with the John De La Howe stuff, it's one of those, well, we'd heard some rumblings, but we didn't really have that push to really start looking at it before um, before uncovering, before um, Tony started asking some some very serious questions about what was happening out there. Um, yeah, it's it's it's, it's been I, tremendous. I, I, no, I would just I would add, uh, Glenn, that uh, I think there's a benefit too sometimes of having uh, an outside person uh, come in because there there you know there there may be an idea of, of amongst people who might know something about um, something that's happening that, well, I can't really be seen talking to the local reporter. I've been told, you know, we, I can tell you from experience, there have been instances where people have been specifically told not to talk to us, <laughs> but maybe, but maybe they'll talk to Tony because nobody, you know, if he, he comes into, a, a, you know, a smaller county, maybe, you know, people don't necessarily know who he is, but maybe they feel a little more comfortable um, confiding in somebody who is from the outside in some cases. There, there's, there's some who would kind of you know, take the opposite view and say like, oh, that's some, some outside person's coming in, I don't wanna to talk to them. But there might be a, an aspect in some instances where local folks maybe can't be seen talking to the local reporter or the local editor or, or, or whatever, but you know, maybe they'll talk to Tony, maybe they'll talk to Avery, maybe they'll talk to Joel, or maybe they'll talk to you. I think that that's an important point. Well, this has been great. And, and we're really hoping to keep Uncovered going uh, even into the next year. We got so many tips, honestly, and some of these things take a long time to, to dig into. So uh, we'd love to keep this partnership going. It's been great working with you all. And, um, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you to Travis. Thank you to Matthew. Thank you to Tony. Um, thank you for everyone who tuned in for watching. And remember, you can sign up for any of our free newsletters at postandcourier.com newsletter slash sign up. Uh, if you're a subscriber, we'd like to say special thank you. And if you're not a subscriber, you can sign up at postandcourier.com slash subscribe. Uh, happy Newspaper Week, everyone. And uh, go out and buy a newspaper. All right. Uh, take care.